Welcome to the Joseph Carlson Show. Thanks for joining. On today's show, Robinhood traders cash in on the market comeback that billionaire investors have missed. So the, the small guy, Robinhood traders, are now beating out billionaires. This is a real article. We're going to be looking at this, reading through this article. I'll give my reaction to it. We also have Jerome Powell. This is the Fed giving their outlook on the economy going forward, his concerns, his thoughts on the subject, what the Fed's doing, and basically the outcome looking forward with the U.S. economy. And then we have my portfolio. It's reached a value of $100,000 recently. We passed that up. I'm going to be talking a little bit about my goals because as far as I'm concerned, we're just getting started here. Now, first of all, I want to jump in with Jerome Powell giving a little bit of an economic update. In this clip, he addresses some of the controversy about the jobs report. So I had an episode about how the jobs report was really good, better than expected. Some people said you can't take it too seriously because of XYZ reason. He's going to outline those reasons. The reason why some people are saying the jobs report really wasn't as good as it seems. The virus and the forceful measures taken to control its spread have induced a sharp decline in economic activity and a surge in job losses. Indicators of spending and production plummeted in April, and the decline in real GDP in the current quarter is likely to be the most severe on record. <clears throat> Even after the unexpectedly positive May employment report, nearly 20 million jobs have been lost on net since February and the unemployment rate has risen about 10 percentage points to 13.3%. As was highlighted by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, this figure likely understates the extent of unemployment, accounting for the unusually large number of workers who reported themselves as employed but absent from their jobs would raise the unemployment rate by about three percentage points. Okay, so that's basically the drama surrounding the jobs report, is it understates it because he says, there's a number of employees that reported themselves as employed, technically speaking, but they were still absent from their jobs, so they're not really working. I think this might be because of the Paycheck Protection Program requires employers to have a certain amount of people still hired, so that might be part of it. But this is where it would edge up the unemployment rate from 13% to 16%. So a little bit worse than what we heard, but still much better than they were expecting. Now, the next thing that I'll highlight is on the subject of inflation. This is one of the, the biggest things when people talk about the Fed and all the actions they're taking, printing all the money, offering all the liquidity, buying all these different securities with a quantitative easing. It's inflation. That's what everybody thinks of. And Jerome Powell is constantly having to remind people about how they've been doing this type of monetary policy for the past 10 years, and they have not seen a lot of inflation. It comes across to me like Jerome Powell is more worried about deflation than inflation. He's not confident in his ability to cause inflation, and he tries to highlight that throughout this whole meeting. Weak demand, especially in sectors most affected by the pandemic, is holding down consumer prices. As a result, inflation has fallen well below our symmetric 2% objective. Indicators of longer-term inflation expectations have been fairly steady. The extent of the downturn and the pace of recovery remain extraordinarily uncertain and will depend in large part on our success in containing the virus. We all want to get back to normal. So there he says that inflation is below the 2% goal. Jerome Powell is equally worried, if not more, about deflation than causing inflation. In fact, part of what he's doing, I think, is to try to create a little bit of inflation because their goal is what he calls a 2% symmetric goal, meaning that if you're at 1% for a while, it's okay to go to 3% for a while because the, the symmetry there is that it would be 2%. That's what they're shooting for, is 2%. Right now we're below that. He's okay causing a little bit of inflation because the bigger concern is having a deflationary environment. That would make the debt very expensive. It could cause a deflation spiral and all these other problems. I think Jerome Powell is fine causing a little bit of inflation. That's part of what he's wanting to do here. Now, the last part that I'll highlight here is he's asked about comparisons of what we're facing right now to the Great Depression. So a lot of people have compared what we're going to to the 1930s Great Depression. Here's his answer on that. And he does lay out a broader view of what he thinks the economic return will be, what he thinks over the long term, the economic results will be, how the recovery will happen. There are just so many fundamental differences. Um, first, the government response has been so fast and so forceful. Uh, the origin was quite different. This was a very, an economy that was in a healthy place. Of course, every economy has longer run challenges, not, and that, that includes our economy, notwithstanding that 50 year low in unemployment and the longest expansion in our history and every reason to think it could continue. So that's different from what was happening uh, around the time of the Great, uh, 
the depression started. The financial system this time was in was in uh, was in very good shape, much better capitalized. So, you know, it's just not the right model. The, I would say we're learning. You know, every month that passes, we're seeing more, we're learning more, and I think particularly the next few months will be very important in learning what the what the real story will be, uh, because we'll see the the significant incoming data about the opening of the economy, the reopening of the economy. You know, and, and I would say. Uh, Assuming that the, that, the, that the disease remains or becomes pretty much under control, um, I think that what you see is a, is a very weak second quarter, historically weak, and then an expansion that builds momentum over time. People will adjust probably a little bit gradually to some of the activities uh, that, w that involve getting together in, small, in large groups in close quarters. Those will be the, the harder parts of the economy to recover, but ultimately, we do see a full recovery over time, and uh, th that's really what uh, uh, you know. What I think I'm, I'm personally seeing, and you could see significant job growth in, in coming months as people return to their jobs. But you're still going to face probably an extended period where it will be difficult for many people to find work, and for and that that's what you see in 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 really many many forecasts at this point. That doesn't mean it's right, but that's sort of a, a broad expectation. Certainly not the depression forecast. So there you go. There's Jerome Powell's long-term view of the economic recovery. He thinks that the second quarter is going to be the most significant negative economic numbers that we've seen. And then he thinks that we'll see a, a pretty sharp recovery after that that might span for a while. It'll be difficult for some people to find jobs for the upcoming year, but we should eventually have a full recovery. Now, I obviously agree. That's why I own stocks. That's why I've put a lot of money into buying these different businesses. My portfolio value is now over $100,000. This is a significant portion of my net worth, okay? So I'm not a millionaire that has $100,000 in a, a portfolio and that represents just some pocket change. That's not the situation here. I have a pretty strong conviction that the US economy will return and it will return quicker than most people think. That's my personal belief. If you believe differently, you might make different investment decisions. So far, it's turned out pretty decent because... I had severe losses when we went into the downturn. The Dow Jones went down 36%. But with my thought process that the stock market would return and that the people that invested during the time where it was most difficult to invest, the people that did it when things were very unclear, they were rewarded for that. If you sold out right here or you bought puts or you went short on the stock market, that was something that really didn't turn out well. I think the strategy that's the most simple, buying good companies for the long term and holding on to them is the best strategy. When I look at my portfolio, I'm buying companies that are reliant on the economy returning back to normal. These aren't all just tech companies that it doesn't matter what the economy does. It's not just Amazon. I'm buying lots of companies that are real estate, they're consumer companies, they're finance and banks. These are companies that are reliant on things returning back to normal. But I think things will return back to normal and I think it will happen faster than what most people think. I went to the mall last week for about an hour and I noticed something while I was there. There was a lot of people there. It was pretty busy. And I noticed something else when I was driving there, the roads were busy. I was getting stuck in traffic. And I was thinking to myself, well, it's frustrating to be stuck in traffic, but what does this mean? A lot of people are moving around, they're going somewhere. They're traveling to some destination. I assume not all of them have three different houses they're driving from one house to the other. They're either going shopping, they're going to restaurants, they're traveling, they're visiting family members. There's economic activity returning. We see stories like this. Shoppers surprise retailers by returning to stores. That's from the Wall Street Journal. Another one from the Wall Street Journal. Movie theaters are opening back up. We have big blockbuster releases coming up, and we're going to see how movie theaters perform. I think people will go back to them. I think people want to view these type of blockbusters in the movie theater. We have news that restaurants are reopening, at least partial capacity, and they have return customers. Again, I have the view that the economy is opening back up, a lot of people are seeing that, and you're seeing people get ahead of it. The people that invested right here had the view that the economy would open back up, we'd see these type of reports and this type of news, and I still think that that will continue. So I'm invested with this portfolio on the premise that we're gonna have an economic recovery, and again, I think it will happen faster than most people think. Now, I do wanna say a couple things about my portfolio. So it recently reached a value of $100,000, Again, to me, that's a, a significant portion of my net worth. This is a lot of money to me. So this isn't a situation where this is like just a little side project for me. This is called passive income. I named it that because 
I view it as an additional stream of income. Basically, I have my work. That's where I do most of my actual active work. I go to work, I, I work on coding, I do development. That's where I earn most of my money. And then I have YouTube, that's an additional stream of income, but that one's also pretty active. I wouldn't consider YouTube a passive income because of the amount of work that goes into it. But then I have this income stream, passive income. This is a portfolio centered around earning dividends and interest that gets paid into my brokerage account. And then I can do whatever I want with it. Usually I reinvest it back into my portfolio. So I've been doing this for the past two years with this account. I started the YouTube about a year into it. And I've been showing on my YouTube page week after week, usually a couple times a week, I'll upload a video and give an update on my portfolio, what I'm buying, what I'm selling, what I'm doing, how it's performing, and my thoughts on current events. So that's what the channel is. That's what I've been doing this entire time. And what I wanna say is that after $100,000, I think it's time to just let you know that we're just getting started with it. This is where I consider that the portfolio is really starting to take off. I plan on getting this thing to a million dollars. And I plan on showing that just like I have with the past 97 episodes, I'm going to be showing week by week the progress of building this portfolio to a value of $1 million. If I can get it to $100,000, a million dollars doesn't seem out of the realm of possibility. $100,000 is one-tenth of the way there, 10%. That's not so crazy of a thought. When you first think about a million dollars, that can seem like an insurmountable amount of money. But when I first thought of $100,000, that thought to me was like an insurmountable amount of money. When you first start saving and start investing, to you it might be $10,000 seems crazy. You've never had that much savings before. Once you get there, the goalposts start to move. You think, well, I have $10,000. All of a sudden you get $20,000. Now it doesn't seem like 10,000 is that crazy. Then you get to $100,000 and here we are. So this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna grow this portfolio from a value of 100,000 that it stands at right now to a million. I'm gonna show you week by week how it performs, what I'm buying, what I'm selling, what's happening with the market, how it's affecting my portfolio. Uh, we're gonna be able to see all of it. You're gonna have a front row seat to this view of this portfolio to a, a significant part of my finances. So I think it'll be interesting to see. My thoughts are, I don't know how it's gonna turn out. So I'm just as much in the know as how this is gonna end up as you are, but we're gonna go through this together. We're gonna see how this turns out. You'll be able to compare your performance with mine, how your investment strategy is doing with mine, whether you're doing one that's similar to mine with dividend investing, or whether you're doing something completely different. In the Discord channel, we have a variety of different investors. Everything from people that are doing options, we have people that are focused on pure growth plays, and we have dividend investors that have similar strategies to mine. So there's a variety of different investors here. We all have common goals, we all wanna make money, and that's what this channel's about. It's about making money, it's about growing wealth. You're gonna be able to see this happen week by week. So uh, it's gonna take a while. I'm not gonna grow this to a million dollars overnight, so, we're gonna see this happen over a, a good amount of time, but I think if I understand compounding, it shouldn't be linear. We should see the growth accelerate as I grow the initial value, the dividends that are paid will become greater. Those, those greater dividends will be reinvested and they'll buy more shares, which pays more dividends. That should be happening. We should see some kind of compounding happening with these companies as well as I plan on buying companies I think are undervalued, ones that I think will do really well. So my hope is that we get to a million dollars quicker than you'd think as well. And if you're listening to this, I would urge you to set a goal as well. Set it for a million dollars. You can get there as well. If it seems like that's not possible, then set it for $100,000 and you will get to 100,000. That seems impossible, set it for $10,000. Usually when you're just starting off investing and you really haven't saved money before in your life, it seems like you can't save up anything because you have habits where you spend most of your money that you earn. But once you just start the routine of saving, you will save up $10,000. Once you get past the initial $10,000, you realize it's possible, it gets the ball to start rolling, and then your, your savings and your investing becomes a routine part of your life and wealth begins to accumulate. So wherever you are, set goals, do the same thing. Mine's for a million dollars. That's gonna be a really difficult goal. It's gonna stretch me a lot. It's obviously a, a huge amount of money if I'm able to achieve that, but that's mine. So I'm gonna try to grow this to a million dollars. We'll see how it goes. Uh, and I'll be showing you everything that I'm doing along the way. Now, as I go along trying to accomplish this, the dividends are gonna play a pretty big impact on this whole goal. In June, just starting with the beginning of this month, we have Aflac paying $19.33, V 
Visa paying $4. We have some ETFs paying $2 here. Pfizer paid $15. June 5th, we have more ETFs paying $3, $2, $1. And then Amgen paid $8.50. Southern Company paid $22. And then June 9th, the last one that I've received is Johnson & Johnson paying $17. So this is what I'm seeing is this constant stream of dividend income. It comes in, it gets deposited into my cash balance. I'm gonna be reinvesting that. As I grow this value and I keep buying companies, the amounts that I'm getting paid in dividends continues to grow as well. If I go to my activity feed here and I go to my trades, I look at the last one that I did here. I'll go over this real quick. Well Tower, I bought $1,000 worth. Simon Property, I bought $500 worth. That's the malls right now. That shows you that I'm bullish on malls returning back to normal. Me going and visiting one last week made my decision on that. I just saw a lot of people there. So I think Simon Property will make it out of this. And then we have some dividends that I threw back in Realty Income Corp, $65. And then Main Street Capital, which is like a little investment bank, I invested $500 into. So these are kind of turnaround plays. These are companies that have really suffered during the economic downturn that I think I'll see both a lot of cash flow from as well as capital appreciation. So I put a combined $2,000 into these companies on the 8th. So those were my buys on Monday. If you want more up to date when I do buys like that, I post them the exact time that I do them on Discord. There's a whole log of all the trades that I do. So you can consider joining that. There's a link in the description and you won't be charged with Discord until the first of next month. So if you join right now, you'll have like three weeks of it for free. Okay, now moving on to some news, I have to respond to this article here. Let me go ahead and just read the title of it. It's from CNBC. Robinhood traders cash in on the market comeback that billionaire investors missed. That's the title of it. This came across when I was reading it. It came across as if it was written by a mod of Wall Street Bets. Let me go ahead and read just a couple highlighted portions of it. One 26-year-old Robinhood trader made $1,500 in less than 24 hours betting on a beaten down airline stock, while many so-called experts on Wall Street warned about buying into an overvalued stock market that was bound to tumble again amid the coronavirus pandemic. Last Thursday, Laquan Godbolt purchased a call option for American Airlines that made him $200 on the millennial-favored stock trading app. After seeing reports that the airline was increasing domestic flying for summer travel, Godbolt bought another call option minutes before the close. When the market opened higher last Friday after surprisingly positive jobs report, Godbolt raked in the profits. Okay, so he raked in the profits on his $200 call option. $200 that he's betting there. Let's go down to the, the next highlighted portion here. Young investors like Godbolt appeared to have a, a prescient understanding of the markets. Like he has a, a foreknowledge of what's going to happen in the markets. Unlike the billionaire hedge fund managers who said stocks would retest their lows. Longtime investor Stanley Druckenmiller, who misjudged equities comeback, said Monday that the market's strong performance over the last three weeks has humbled him and that he underestimated the power of the Federal Reserve. Even the legendary investor Warren Buffett sold his stake in airlines during the pandemic. Of course, the Berkshire Hathaway chairman is a long-term bargain shopper, and the airlines industry long-term outlook is yet to be determined. Okay, do I really have to point out the, the teeny minor detail that I think this article is missing here? So we have Godbolt, who has the, the foreknowledge. He can see the future. He has the prescient vision of the future. And then we have Warren Buffett, who, you know, he obviously is washed up at this point. I think it's a good comparison, aside from the really tiny detail that Godbull is working with $200 and he's making a call option with a couple hundred dollars and Warren Buffett is controlling one of the top 10 biggest companies in the United States, a company that has a nearly $500 billion market cap. So that's a just a minor caveat there. That Godbolt is working with a couple hundred dollars and then Warren Buffett's working with hundreds of billions of dollars. Aside from that minor detail, I think that they make a really solid point here. And then I came across this video of Dave Portnoy. He's somewhat of an entertainer. He owns Barstool Sports, but here he is calling Warren Buffett an idiot. Alaska Airlines up 17%. Boeing up 13%. Carnival up 16%. Delta up 7.5%. What is? What do you do if you listen to old man Buffett? Get out on the airlines, idiot. What an idiot. Norwegian up 18%. Okay, so there he is calling Warren Buffett an idiot. And here he is saying right now that he's a better investor than Warren Buffett. But I find funny though, 
the people on the internet who is debating who the better investor is right now, myself or Warren Buffett, it's no debate. I mean, it's no debate. I killed him. He's dead. He's dead. I'm not saying I had a better career. I'm not saying I have more money than he does. He, he's, he's a Hall of Famer. He's one of the best to ever do it. No doubt. He's old and he's washed up. I'm the new breed. I'm the new generation. You can't, there's nobody who can argue that Warren Buffett's better at the stock market than I am right now. I'm better than he is. It's a fact. You're just going to have to deal with it. The blue child, oh, Warren, how do you go after Warren? Listen, he's an old man. His time passing by, I'm sure he's nice. But how can you debate facts? Facts. So there you have it. Dave Portnoy is, is calling Warren Buffett washed up. He's better than him. He's beating him at his own game. And Warren Buffett's old. That's, uh, that's, that's his take on it. Now, I just want to point out one thing for Dave Portnoy, if you're listening. I know you're a fan of facts, so I just want to point out one fact here. The washed up uh, idiot Warren Buffett, so far this year, year to date, has made $11 billion on one holding. One investment. He's made $11 billion. That's year to date. So six months into the year. The airlines that you're talking about, those are actually a small investment. They're a very small part of Berkshire's portfolio. The amount of money that he lost on it is more like a rounding error. His biggest holding, Apple, so far this year, he's made $11 billion in gains. So uh, this is the person that apparently his time has passed him. He's washed up. He's made more money this year with one holding than Dave Portnoy has his entire career. So I just wanted to point out that one thing. I thought it would be an interesting fact to share. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to emails. The email address is joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. That's joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. You can email in any questions you have, any criticisms, anything like that. Uh, The first one is from Alex. He says, or she says, I'm not sure. Hello, I wanted to thank you for your videos and all the time and energy you put into your delivery. I guess you could say I'm a new investor outside of the retirement plans. So new, in fact, that I actually started my portfolio at the beginning of the COVID-19 downturn. Most of my acquisitions were made near or at the bottom of the turbulent market that we seem to be recovering from. During the downturn, I was invested heavily into equity companies, and now my entire portfolio is up almost 30% from its origin. It's becoming harder and harder to find deals. And because I began investing when prices were low, it's a tough time for me to dollar cost average. I know as a dividend investor, I shouldn't be so focused on price, but it's almost painful for me to ruin my average price paid per share. Any advice moving forward as the market appears to recover, at the end of the day, I feel like I'm just going to have to bite the bullet and view it as a 401k where you just continue to contribute no matter what. Thanks again, Alex. Well, this is a good question, Alex. I think this is something that most of us struggle, especially after seeing this epic recovery over the past two months. We've really seen a historic recovery in the market. And a lot of the companies that were trading at really steep discounts, comparatively speaking, are now back to really where they were at the start of the year. So it doesn't seem like you're getting as much of a deal. This is part of the reason why I think it has to do with your investing mindset. My mindset is not so much looking at every company that's gone down in value. I want to buy it so that it can return back up to where it was. My mindset is more looking at these are companies that I just want to own. These are companies I want to have ownership of. I see a really bright future with them going forward the next 20 years. That's the basis that I pick the companies that I have. They're ones that I want to have shares in. They're ones that I want to own. Now, For me to have the most ownership possible, it's better for me to buy when they're down in price. So anytime that happens, I'm going to try to put as much emphasis on buying as many shares as I can as the price goes down on companies I want to own. But the fact that I want to own them doesn't change when the price returns back to where it probably should be, when they're not as undervalued as they were before. Uh, So I still want to own these companies in that place. I'm still going to buy them. If the storyline changes for a company and I no longer want to own it, then I sell out of it. I've done that with a couple of companies. I I sold out of Boeing. I don't really care what the returns are with it. The company was a mess when I sold out of it. So whether the stock price goes up or down, there's lots of companies that the stock price goes up and down on, but it's just a company I didn't want to own anymore. I didn't want to deal with what they're doing. I didn't know how to do analysis on it. So if the story changes on a certain stock, I sell out of it. I keep the ones that I want to own in the future. Even if the stock Disney goes down in price, 
it doesn't matter. I still want to own it. If it goes up in price, it doesn't matter. I still want to own it. That storyline has not changed. So I just look at it as companies that I want to have ownership of. If they go down in price, I want to buy as much as possible. But that doesn't change if they go up in price. I just try to focus in my portfolio on the ones that I think are currently the best value. So I'll look through all my holdings, all the companies that I want to own, and the ones that are trading at the cheapest of where I think they should be, those are the ones I put emphasis on. And I gave a couple examples of those type of buys that I've done in this episode. I want to own Simon Property. That's a company that I want to have ownership of. It's down in price a lot right now. It's still down in price. So I bought some Simon Property. I want to own Well Tower. I bought $1,000 of it because I think that senior assisted living facilities will be a thing in the future 10 years from now, and they will have more demand than they do right now. So these are companies that are still far undervalued of where I think they'll be in the next two or three years that I can buy right now. So I'm going to continue to do that. Ross says, Joseph, love your content. This morning, I logged into my investment account to see that I earned my first dividend payment, $7.73 and dividend stock purchase. Small, but still exciting. Looking forward to the next 25 years of dividend payments. Well, Ross, congratulations on the first dividend payment. I think that's a landmark. That's a point of celebration. And I don't really even say that sarcastically. I do think it's a landmark when you earn your first dividend payment because it opens up a new concept to you. People that haven't invested before, I think a lot of them have no clue that you can own companies and they just pay you money passively via your ownership of them. When you explain this idea of dividend investing, of owning these companies, and then paying you just for having shares in them, it's a pretty incredible concept. It seems totally normal. It seems obvious to people that have been investing for a long time, but there's a lot of people that have no clue about this. So learning about it, earning your first dividend, it does change things. That's how a lot of it started with me. I earned my first dividend and I thought, this is incredible. These companies will pay me and I don't have to work for them. I don't have to do anything for them. I can just invest my money if I do it intelligently and not just focus on the dividend, but the other aspects of the company, if it's sustainable, if it can grow over time, all these are the things. If I do this intelligently, I can grow this first dividend that I'm earning, the $7.73. I can multiply this. I can use the money I'm being paid, reinvest it into other companies to also earn more money. Before you know it, Ross, you're going to be earning $7.73 every single day. You really will, and I think it will happen pretty quickly. My portfolio, just at the value it's at right now, at around 100000 I think it's earning something around $11 a day, every single day. That's seven days a week. It never sleeps. So when you start multiplying this, getting it to the point where you're getting these dividend payments all the time, it really starts to take off. So I'm excited for you as well. Just wanted to congratulate you on that first payment. Okay, Jim from Ohio says, Hi, Joseph. I've been a viewer of your YouTube channel for many months now. I enjoy the content and relate to your investing philosophy. I share your show with many friends and family who are looking for advice. I appreciate you doing that, Jim. Uh, He says, I'm 57 and in pretty good financial shape. I've never made a lot of money, but have been consistently employed for 35 years, always contributed to the max of my 401k. Not easy, but we manage. Today, much of our portfolio is invested in 35 stocks, diversified into similar buckets as you do, which are earning a solid 4% dividend passive income, which will support us in the retirement in about a year. Instead of asking a question, I thought I would offer an observation. Several family slash friends ask how to get started, and I wanted to give you feedback that you are spot on with your advice. The key to your financial well-being is less about your stock picks and more rooted in four things. One, consistently investing slash dollar cost averaging smart wise positions, index funds, or blue chips. Two, pay yourself first, max out your 401k, etc. Three, take advantage of many tax advantage products, IRA, Roth, HSA, 529 plans, etc. Four, avoid as much debt as possible, wise fundamental choices. For now, keep up the good work and I'll continue to look at your channel for a voice of reason as we navigate this thing called life. Sincerely, Jim from Ohio. Well, Jim, first of all, congratulations on getting close to retirement. You're a year from retirement and you're in a good financial position. So that's awesome to hear. Congratulations on that. I really didn't have much to add. I just wanted to highlight this as an example. We have a lot of people at every different stage of investments here. Just like I pointed out in the last email, someone just had their first dividend payment. So they're just right at the beginning of this. And then we have people in your situation where you're kind of at the end in terms of building your investments, you're more just focused on retiring and enjoying them. So 
We see everything in between. And I think it's good to get validation from people on your stage saying that the advice here is good. It's going to lead to a good outcome. I think that's a good thing. And most of the people that I talk to that are in your situation, they say the same things. So I think that's awesome to see. I love seeing success stories like yours, people that really have done things right financially and you see how it turns out. So uh, congratulations on that. And I hope in a year you have a, a great retirement. All right. Well, on that note, I'm going to go ahead and end this episode here. I appreciate everybody that's been sharing the channel with their friends and people they think can benefit from seeing this unfold. I have a portfolio. You're seeing real investments happen week after week. People that you think might benefit from seeing that happen, from learning about it, share the channel with them, see what they think of it. That's where I get a lot of the new viewership. That's where a lot of people come from is other people just sharing different episodes with them. So I appreciate everybody that does that. I'll have another video out probably this weekend. So if you haven't hit the subscribe button and I'll check in with you guys this week.